This presentation is part of the TI in Focus AP Calculus video series. In this video, I'll discuss the solutions, relevant concepts, and some scoring guidelines associated with a part of our 2020 mock AP Calculus exam. My name is Steve Kokoska. I'm a professor at Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania, and I'm a former AP Calculus chief reader. The 2020 AP Calculus exam was unique in many ways. The number of questions, the total number of points, the ways in which students submitted responses, and in utilizing online scoring. None of the forms administered to students during the 2020 exam will be released, that is, posted on AP Central. However, these questions will be available for use in the AP Classroom. To help understand how the 2020 exam was scored and to emphasize the important concepts tested, we've constructed a similar mock exam. Each of these videos will consider the concepts necessary to solve each problem, present detailed solutions, and discuss theoretical scoring guidelines based on past practice, and a few interpretations of these scoring guidelines. Form AB1 involves a continuous function f with domain minus 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 9. The graph of f is given, and it consists of three line segments and two quarter circles. And a new function g is defined as g of x is the definite integral from 0 to x of f of t dt for x between minus 2 and 9. Part A asks the student to find the x-coordinate of each critical point of g on the interval minus 2 to 9. There are two, well, at least two important concepts that the student needs to use in order to answer this question. First, we need to use the definition of a critical point. A critical number, or a critical point, of a function f is a number c in the domain of f such that f prime of c is equal to 0 or f prime of c does not exist. Now one comment here. We traditionally use the phrase critical point, but we really mean a critical number, not a point in the plane. And in order to solve this problem, we'll also need the most important idea in all of AP calculus, the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says if f is a continuous function on the closed interval a, b, and the function g is defined by g of x is the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt, then g is continuous on the closed interval a, b, and differentiable on the open interval a, b, and g prime of x is equal to f of x. Now I often think of this function g as an area so far function. And what I mean by that is, if f of x is greater than or equal to 0, then we're accumulating the area under the graph of f from a to x. Here's a little closer look at this theorem. In words, it says that the derivative of a definite integral with respect to its upper limit is the integrand evaluated at that upper limit. And here's some other notation associated with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Notice the use of the variable t in the integrand. t and x have two different meanings in this expression, and so they should be two different variables. Here's a solution to this problem. We need to find the critical points of g. So the first thing we need to do is to find the derivative g prime. Using the fundamental theorem of calculus, g prime of x is equal to f of x. Now, we don't have an analytic expression for f, only a graph. So we need to look at the graph and find all those places where f is 0 or does not exist. So looking at the graph, f of x is equal to 0 when x is equal to minus 1, 2, and 7. There are no places where f of x does not exist. 
f is defined for all x in the interval minus 2 to 9. Now, there are some places where f prime does not exist, but these x coordinates are not relevant to this part of the problem. So finally, the critical points of g are x equal minus 1, 2, and 7. Part A was worth one point, and the student earns this point for presenting the three critical values. Here are some scoring notes or interpretations of the scoring guidelines. First, to earn this point, the student must present all three critical values. Just two of the three, and the student does not earn the point. There is no partial credit here or part of a point. In this problem, no supporting work is necessary. Now, we usually ask students to show all of their work, but here, the student can simply read the critical numbers from the graph. So, just presenting the three values is sufficient to earn the point. If the student presents extra numbers in the interval minus 2 to 9, in addition to the three correct values, then they do not earn the point. And if any of the three correct values is missing, they do not earn the point. They need all three, and exactly three. However, we won't look at the endpoints or any numbers outside the open interval. So, for example, a student could present minus 1, 2, 7, and 12, and still earn all three points. Some students present critical points as ordered pairs. So if we see ordered pairs here, we will read only the x-coordinates. Part B of Form AB1 asks students to classify each critical point from Part A as the location of a relative minimum, a relative maximum, or neither for G. And we need some justification here. Now, here's a little background necessary, I think, to answer this question. You'll recall that Fermat's theorem says that if a function f has a local maximum or minimum at c, then c must be a critical number of f. But remember, the converse of this theorem is not true. That is, not every critical number is the location of a local maximum or a local minimum. So, we need to recall a method to determine whether f has a local maximum or minimum or neither at c. A typical way to solve this problem to make this determination is to use the first derivative test. This says that suppose c is a critical number of a continuous function f. If f prime changes from positive to negative at c, then f has a local maximum at c. If f prime changes from negative to positive at c, then f has a local minimum at c. And if f is positive both on the left and the right of c, or negative on both the left and the right of c, then f has neither a local max nor a local min at c. To solve this problem, let's go back to the graph of g prime equal to f. We can see from the graph that g prime equal f changes from positive to negative at x equal minus 1. Therefore, g has a relative maximum there. Similarly, at x equal 2, g prime, which is f, changes from negative to positive. So g has a relative minimum there. And at x equals 7, g prime equal f does not change sign. So g has neither a relative max nor a relative min there. Part B was worth three points. One point each for correctly classifying each critical point from Part A. And I think this is a pretty typical scoring convention for this type of problem. Here are some scoring interpretations. Each critical point from Part A must be presented with a correct justification to earn the point. Justifications based on G prime are eligible for all three points. That is, the student can use only G prime in their justifications. However, if the response is based only on the function f, 
the student is still eligible for all three points, but only if they've made the connection that g prime is equal to f somewhere in part a or part b. If no connection is presented, then the student can earn at most two of the three points. Here are some additional scoring notes for part b. Now some students in these types of problems use vague references in their justifications. So in this problem, if a student uses the phrase, the graph, we will assume that this means the graph of f given in the statement of the problem. However, justifications that refer to the function, or it, or the slope, are just too vague. There are a couple of functions already in this problem, a couple of possible slopes, and we just don't know and can't assume what it refers to. Now, the student can still earn one point if replacing every occurrence of the function or it or the slope with g prime produces a response that would earn all three points. Some students may discuss g prime at a specific point rather than in a neighborhood. For example, a student may say that g prime of minus 1 changes from positive to negative. Now we usually treat this as poor communication, and the student can earn at most two of the three points in this part of the problem. If they talk about a specific point with correct responses or classifications in all three cases, then they earn two points. And if they have two correct classifications, they earn one point. Remember that a sign chart alone is not sufficient to earn any points. The student must interpret a sign chart with a written explanation. Now, some students may actually attempt to answer this question by using a candidate's test. They're eligible for all three points here, but they must include correct values for g at the three critical numbers. And finally, some students may make a communication error here by presenting a global instead of a local argument. Now, this is a little subtle. These students say something like, f is positive for x less than minus 1 and negative for x greater than minus 1. That's a global argument about the sign of f. These students are eligible for at most two points if all three classifications are correct. I hope this video gives you a good idea of how to solve these problems using the necessary AP Calculus concepts and a reasonable expectation of how they would be scored. We'll look at more parts of this free response question in the next video.